This Bible study is going to be on Genesis chapter 9, the curse that Noah placed upon his grandson Canaan. And like most, many of my studies, I wouldn't say most, but many of my studies, this is going to be controversial. You know, that's the thing. I like to tackle the harder things of the Bible. I'm not uh, puffed up with pride saying I know all the things that are going on. A lot of times the Bible gives you some indications, but sometimes it doesn't lay out everything that you need to make a 100% be positive of something of what had happened. So, with that being said, let's turn to Genesis chapter 9, and we'll uh, take a look at what happened here. All right, let's take a look. Genesis chapter 9. Now, I have an entire playlist on what happened in Genesis 6, why the Lord destroyed the earth in the flood. And it just absolutely boggles my mind, the number of people that just can't believe plain scripture, what the Bible says in Genesis 6, and what happened. You have to let the Bible interpret the Bible. You don't take the New Testament and interpret the Old Testament with it. It just doesn't always work that way. But people do that. And in Genesis 6, you had the sons of God. And if you don't know who they are, you look it up in Job 38. The sons of God shouted for joy when the earth was created. When the foundations of the earth were laid, the sons of God shouted for joy. And there are people that will tell you, oh, well, the New Testament says sons of, God's are, sons of God are believers. Well, that's true. They are when they're born of the Holy Spirit, when they're born again. But the thing is, in Job 38, the sons of God shouted for joy when the earth was created. And then they'll tell you that, oh, well, the sons of God are uh, the children of Adam. Well, Adam didn't come until day six after the earth was created. I'm sorry, but the children of Adam were not shouting for joy before they were formed and created. It just doesn't work that way, people. Uh, and besides that, if the sons of God are not angels that were shouted for joy when the earth was created... Show me from the Bible what day the angels were created. Day one? No. Day two? No. Day three? No. Day four? No. Day five? No. Day six? No. Day seven? No. Because that was the Sabbath day the Lord rested from his creation and enjoyed. The angels were not shown to have been created on the first seven days and on the seventh day, that was the end of God doing his creation. No more creation. He rested. Everything was created either before. Well, everything was either before the Lord created the earth or during the six days. During the six days, he created the uh, heavens and the earth. If the Lord didn't... Well, you know, it, it is possible... The Lord created the angels, but he didn't record when. But personally, I believe he created the angels before he created the earth. Because the Bible doesn't record the Lord creating the angels on days 1 through 7. Doesn't, doesn't record it anywhere. So in Job 38, when the sons of God shouted for joy before... Uh, while, you know, while the earth, the foundations of the earth were being laid, it had to have been angels. So when you read Genesis 6, and it says the sons of God created, uh, came in unto the daughters of men. I mean, come on, people. You know, the fallen angels tried to corrupt the, uh, the bloodline. I mean, that's, that's what it has to be. 
And, and so many people, they won't spend the time studying the Bible. You know, they just want to read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the end of their theology. God loves everything and everybody, and that's why he destroyed the world in the flood, right? All right, so... Genesis 6, giants, God destroyed the earth in the flood. Genesis 9 is when Noah gets out of the ark. Okay, let's read it. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air that and uh, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered did you notice that god gave dominion of all the animals to the children of adam and you got these Wiccan, witch, nature-loving people that, you know, animal rights and this and that and the other. And no, I don't think people should be cruel to animals. Matter of fact, I, when I see people, some of the stuff they do to dogs and cats and other animals, I, I would, wouldn't, wouldn't bother me too much if somebody killed the people that did that stuff. But um, what can I tell you? But that's just my opinion. Verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is in the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. See, vampirism, uh, people devouring, you know, blood. Right here, Bible you know, Genesis 9 says, don't mess with it. Verse 5, And surely your blood of your lies will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, that's their life, right? By man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So, if you kill somebody, you're supposed to be killed. A murderer is supposed to be killed. That's just God's law, people. That's If you don't like God's law, you can enjoy the new world order that's coming because, because we don't want God's law. God's going to let you have the other guy's law, and you it's going to look pretty. It's going to look pretty, but it's not. They got a fruit here in Florida. It's called the death apple. This tree, if, if, you, if you get under this tree in a, a rainstorm and just the water going off the leaves uh, and you stand underneath it and the water off the rain coming off the leaves falls on you, it burns your skin. If you eat the fruit, it tastes like an apple. It's delicious. An hour later, you're dead. It's called the death apple. Yeah. The uh, Spanish explorers that came to Florida discovered it. This tree, if you touch the sap, it burns. You put it in your eyes, you go blind. The stuff is nasty. I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's... Uh, God's laws, you know? But the thing is, we were made in God's image. So when somebody kills another person for whatever reason, for anger, because they want to steal their things, their stuff that God had given them, the, it was, you know, murderers were to be put to death, the death sentence, not locked up in these private prisons. So these... Um, Kosher bankers can make a profit off of, you know, warehousing criminals and then letting them out after five or ten years. 
to go out and do the same thing again. It's disgusting. Verse 7, And you, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. God said to multiply. The elite says, oh, we've got to uh, have population control. You know, they want to, Georgia Guidestones, they want to wipe out 95% of the earth's population. Hey, if you want to wipe out 95% of the earth's population, I say start with China and India. Two-sevenths of the world's population lives in India. China has, I think, 1.5 billion, and India has like 0.8 billion people. That's uh, 800 million. That's, you know, uh, if the global elite want to start population control, I say, well, if you want to start there, that's, you know, I won't argue with you. Not that I, I don't hate the Chinese or the Indians, but I'm just saying. And God spake unto Noah and to his son, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Seed is children, people. They're not trees. So when they're talking about seed, they're talking about children. God was said he's going to establish his covenant with Noah. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Okay. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Perpetual means forever. I do set my bow in the cloud, rainbow, you know, shaped like a bow, bow and arrow. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will... And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. That's right. Next time when the Lord destroys the earth, it's going to be by fire. And uh, that's one of the elements that the uh, witches love. You ever heard of earth, wind, fire? Uh, earth, wind, fire, and water? Well, that's their four of their elements that the uh, witches worship. So God used uh, water. Next time it's going to be fire. Uh, let's see. It's in Peter. If you want to read uh, 1 and 2 Peter about the uh, destruction of the earth by fire. Uh, let's see. All right, uh, let's see, verse 15. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Everlasting, forever. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Shem is where the Hebrews derived from. Uh, let's see. Where Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Canaan. Canaan was the father of all the Canaanites that God told the children of Shem to go and wipe them out later on. And if you'll notice, ham is not a kosher food. It's pig. Ham is not kosher. Ham is the father of Canaan. Verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. 
And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Okay, so evidently he had some grapes or grape seeds, right? And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. So, you know, I don't know. If uh, I just survived a worldwide flood of destruction, I wonder if I'd get drunk too, you know. Ugh. But uh, he got drunk and naked. All right, uh, verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Now, that's a very interesting statement. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. We're going to look that up, so remember that. And told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a, took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now, there's a double meaning to this, people. Uh, you know, a lot of English words have double meanings. Okay? You, uh, a seamstress, a woman, you know, that would sew clothing, oftentimes she was called a sewer, S-E-W-E-R. Okay, and when you flush the toilet, that water and whatever's in it goes to the sewer, S-E-W-E-R. Same spelling, different word, different meaning. Uh, I remember a stupid pun when I was a young kid. Why did the golfer wear, you know, a golfer, you know, like Tiger Woods playing golf, why did the tie? Uh, why did the golfer wear two pairs of pants? Well, simple. In case he got a hole in one. For for those of you gals that don't know it, um, that's a golf term. That when you the club hits the ball, the ball goes into the hole with one shot. It's very rare, but it happens, and, and that's what they call a hole in one. But you could get a hole in one of your pants, right? I know, it's stupid. But it's a, you know, it's a play on words. English has got a tons of those. So, the nakedness of his father. I think it's, there's a double meaning here. We're going to take a look. All right, so, Shem and Japheth, uh, the good sons, took a garment and covered up their father, and they didn't look at him, right? Uh, let's see, verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son, son had done. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, Ham sodomized his father. I don't know. I They read into that. I don't, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I, I just don't read, I just don't see it in the text. I really don't. It's possible I don't know. Verse 25. So Noah awakes from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Now here it is. Ham, the father of Canaan, is the one that did this. Okay? He's the one that saw the nakedness of his father. All right? And yet Noah is cursing Canaan, his son. What? Why not? Why didn't he curse Ham? You know, I always looked at this and always wondered, why is that? If Ham was the guilty one, the father, why is Noah cursing his son, Canaan, the son of Ham? I'm like, what? Doesn't make any sense. All right, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, which is Ham, right? 
And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. A slave? And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Shem's where the Hebrews came from, people. Verse 27. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So Noah was about, I don't know, uh, 600, around 600 years old when all this transpired. So, what happened? Well, let's take a look. The nakedness of the Father. Let's take a look at that real quick. All right, turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 18. For those of you that don't know it, there were 12 tribes of Israel. One of the tribes was the tribe of Levi. That's what the book of Leviticus was for. The book of Leviticus was written specifically for the tribe of Levi. They were the tribes of the priests. Uh, the priests were the ones, they were to serve the Lord. They were the ones that did the tabernacle, carried the ark. They were the ones that served the Lord. They didn't get a land inheritance in Israel. Okay? King David was of the tribe of Judah. They were to be the tribe of the kings, the rulers, the civil rulers. The Levites were the religious leaders, the religious rulers, and Judah was to be the civil rulers, okay? Um, I guess you could say, like, King David would have been like the president in the United States, or if you live in England, like the king or queen or whatever. And then the uh, Levites were to be like the Congress or the Supreme Court, or in England, like the House of Commons, the House of Lords, I don't know. Uh, roughly that's how it would work. That was the division of power. The Levites would tell the king what the Lord laws said, and the king would carry the laws out. So if somebody was caught committing a murder, and there was witnesses, the king would make sure that the murderer was executed. That's how it worked. All right, so uh, the book of Leviticus was for the Levites. Um, wow, I'm going to have to read this whole... I wasn't going to read this, um, this whole chapter. I was just going to read an excerpt, but I think I need to read this. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Um, by the way, Le Moses and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwell, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, Whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Okay, right now they're in the land of Egypt. And he's saying, what they do, I don't want you doing what they're doing. Don't do what the Egyptians do. And by the way, did you know that the Egyptians were the children Children of Canaan settled in Egypt and Ethiopia. We're going to get to that later. And uh, he also says, and, and after, you know, the doings of the land of Canaan, you know, the things that they're doing, don't do it. Don't walk in their ordinances. Don't walk in their laws. Don't do the things that they do. I hate the things that they do. 
I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. You stay away from what they're doing. And what is America doing today? We do everything that all the satanic practices that the Canaanites were doing, we're basically doing today in America. I mean, you know, uh, the abortion's legal, witchcraft is legal, uh, Jesus Christ, the name, the Bible, is not allowed in public schools, but you can have Harry Potter, you can have the Church of Satan, uh, the, the, the Satanic Bible, no problem. But if you brought a King James Bible to school, the principal would have a cow and suspend your kids. Yeah, they'd have a cow, all right. A holy cow. You know, that's, that's Hindu India stuff. Never mind. Verse 4. Ye, ye, who? Israel, ye, ye shall do my judgments. Whose judgments? God's. Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances, mine ordinances, to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. The laws that I give you, you're, that's what you need to be doing. Not the Canaanites, not the Egyptians, not this other filth. Now listen to this. And, and these people that tell you that all the laws were nailed to the cross, well, ask yourself a question. Do these laws that I'm getting ready to read apply today? Verse 6. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Ah, uncover their nakedness. Think about it, people. What do you do when you're getting ready to have sex with your spouse? You take their clothes off. You take your clothes off, right? You're uncovering their nakedness. I mean, you know, I don't want to be crude, but I mean, think about it. Verse 7. Okay, well, let's read that again. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him. Do you know what kin means? Kindred, it means relatives. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Okay? Daughters are not supposed to sleep with their father. Sons are not supposed to sleep with their mothers. And when I say sleep, I'm loosely meaning sex, okay? The nakedness of thy father's wife thou shalt not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now, is I think this is talking about a stepmother. Okay, maybe the father is a widower, his wife died. You know, she was your... He was, you know, the, that was your, the son's mother, okay? The nakedness of thy father's wife thou shalt not uncover. You know, maybe it's a stepmother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is thy father's nakedness. Hmm. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now, does that apply to what happened to Noah? Let's read that again. Uh, Genesis 9, 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without... And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered their fa covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Does this have a double meaning? I don't know. But it wouldn't be surprising to me. The nakedness of thy father's wife, Leviticus 18.8, 8, 
The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now listen to verse 9. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother. So it could either be a full, you know, a full sister or a half sister. Whether she is born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Do you know why there's laws in the United States and England and other places uh, why you can't marry direct blood relatives? Well, they only started finding out about uh, genetic defects within families, like within the last you know, I don't know, 50, 70 years, you know, when they started doing DNA testing and genetics and all that stuff. Now, there were, when cousins and brothers and sisters were all getting married, you know, the children were born with all kinds of birth defects because the defects in the genetics were, it was multiplied. And uh, the royal Russian family, uh, prior to the communist revolution in Russia, they were riddled with it. I'm just riddled with defects. They had uh, hemophilia, uh, which is if you get a cut, you can't stop, the blood doesn't clot, you just keep bleeding. Uh, there were people in the royal Russian family, they got a cut and they bled to death. I mean, simple minor cuts, uh, stuff that would, wouldn't even affect us. So let me ask you a question. If the law was nailed to the cross, can brothers and sisters get married? I mean, you know, this is what the Baptists teach nowadays. Well, the law was nailed to the cross, a praise of Jesus. I mean, let's face it, people. Should, should brothers and sisters be allowed to get married? Or does this law still apply? I mean, I'm not going to tell you what, you know, I, I you know... So, uh, let's see. All right, uh, let's see. Verse 10, Leviticus 18.10. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. Can a father have sex with his son's daughter? That's This is what this is saying. Uh-uh. No. Or your, or your daughter's daughter. You know, can a father have sex with his granddaughter? Uh, you know, it says, for, their, for theirs is thine own nakedness. Verse 11. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinswoman. That's a cousin. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for th she is thy mother's near kinsman, kinswoman. I, you know, we could keep... Well, we'll, we'll read one more. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. I mean, okay, I mean, you get the idea, right? You know? So was all this stuff nailed to the cross? I don't know. So what was the sin of Ham seeing the nakedness of his father? Was it just looking at his dad when he's asleep, drunk? You know, if that was the case, um, well, let's read verse 24. Genesis 9, verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. You know, if... if Ham had just looked at his dad, and his dad wakes up from a drunken stupor. How would he know what his son had done? You know, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Did he sodomize his father? I don't know. Did he 
sleep with his dad's wife? I, I don't know. That's generally what it means to uncover thy father's nakedness. You know, it's it's not real, real clear, but that's kind of how I'm leaning. So, uh, let's see. So, and then why does why does Noah curse Ham's son when it was Ham that was guilty of the offense? You know, it makes me wonder. Personally, this is what I believe. I believe that Ham took a wife of the fallen angels of Genesis 6 and brought her aboard or one of the, you know, uh, maybe one of the children. You know, I, I know it says there were giants in those days, but when you study out, the, the giants were one of the tribes of the Canaanites, and not all the Canaanites were giants, because one of the tribes of the Canaanites came to, I don't want to do the big study on this, one of the tribes of the Canaanites came to uh, Joshua after Moses had died, and they asked Joshua, well, we come from a far country, and we want to be... Um, we want to make a league with you. We want to make a partnership. We want to be friends with you. You know, make a make a league with us. Make a promise with us. And Joseph, I'm sorry, Joshua didn't inquire of the Lord, and he made a promise to them that they wouldn't be have wars against each other. Well, then they find out that these people are Canaanites, that they live here. And they were the people God commanded that they were to be exterminated. And Joshua and the people were um, unhappy because God had told them. And what happens, Israel ends up intermarrying a lot of these people. You know, but, but if these people, you know, let's face it. If Joshua was five or six foot tall and he's looking at a nine or 12 foot giant, somebody that's twice as tall, he would have said, oh, wait a minute, you're the giants. Uh, I can't make a, a, a league or a promise or a, a peace treaty with you people. You're the people we're supposed to be fighting. The Lord says to wipe you people out. So obviously, not all the Canaanites, like, you know, the Philistines were the giants. Not all the Canaanites had to have been giants. They... They had to look just like the Israelites. They had to look the same. Otherwise, Joshua would have said, oh, wait a minute, you, you people are, you know, you're the giants. We can't make a promise with you. So, you know, it, it's just kind of just doesn't make, it kind of doesn't make sense. So Noah wakes up and he knew what his younger son had done. Did he sodomize his dad? I mean, you know, you would be hurting down there if if that's what he did. You'd know something was up. Or you go in to visit your wife and she's crying and says, your son, your son raped me. Now, you'd know that too, wouldn't you? And... Um, if memory serves me correctly, Noah didn't have any children after this. Because if if your wife was um, defiled, according to the Bible law, you were not able to go in under her. And that's a whole other study in and of itself. But I don't believe I don't believe Noah had any children. So. What was the what was the uh, sin of Ham? I'm not sure. Either he sodomized his dad, or he had sex with Noah's wife. Was it his mother? I don't know. Was it a stepmother? I don't know. But Noah didn't curse his son for the sin that his son did. He cursed his grandson. And the best thing that I can figure out is Ham 
had probably married one of the daughters of maybe one of the fallen angels. I don't know. But I don't believe Shem or Japheth did that. I don't think so. All right, so Ham sinned against Noah, and Noah curses Ham's son, his grandson, Canaan. Let's take a look at Canaan. Oh, uh, let's see. Genesis 10 and chapter 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizram and Put and Canaan. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 15. Now this is this is the line that Noah cursed, okay? And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Sidon and Heth were not very highly spoken of in Scripture. Oh, before I start getting into the genealogy of the Can Canaan and the Canaanites, I want to uh, just mention, the um, in Genesis 9, when Noah cursed Canaan, or cursed, I've heard it pronounced both ways, Caribbean, Caribbean, laboratory, laboratory, you know, I don't know. It's sort of like the English. They spell things funny, right? They spell color, C-O-L-O-U-R. But, uh, you know, we Americans, we got it right, C-O-L-O-R, right? Now, the first time something is cursed in the Bible, now this is this is very interesting. I wish people would spend a lot of time in Genesis. They would understand the Bible a lot more. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, they're idiots. They really are. The Old Testament's the foundation. The New Testament is the roof. And if you don't have a strong foundation, the roof will collapse. you got to have a strong foundation to place those walls on, to put the roof on top. You know, they think it doesn't matter. Well, if you want to understand the Bible, it matters. If you just want salvation, yeah, you can read John 3.16, and you can find salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I agree, but but you won't. There's more prophecy in the Old Testament than there is in the New. Did you know that? There's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament, and people don't bother to read it. It kills me. All right, let's take a look at um, Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first time that the word cursed or cursed appears. Genesis 3.12. Now, this is Adam and Eve had just eaten of the fruit of the garden. You know, that the, the tree of good knowledge, uh, good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The fall, people, the fall of Adam. Genesis 3 and verse 12. And the man said, Yeah, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. See, Adam's blaming Eve. No, actually, he's blaming God. You know that woman that you gave me, Lord? Yeah, she did it. The devil made me do it. You ever heard of that one? Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Boy, I tell you what, there is a lot, 
a lot of meat in this chapter, and people are just so stupid. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Now, realize something. The Bible tells you who the serpent is. In Revelation, it says that old serpent, the devil and Satan. This is not a talking snake. Hanging from an apple tree, like the stupid church art you, read, you, you look at. Snakes don't talk. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, hatred, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. According to this, the devil, I mean the serpent, has seed. And there's going to be hatred between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And it shall Bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The way I look at this, what I find very interesting of this is, this, this is the first, basically, the, the prophecy, saying, well, yeah, the serpent seed's going to bruise the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman's going to crush the serpent's head. Hmm. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know, basically, as far as I'm concerned, this is the first promise of the Redeemer. You know, I, I personally, that's what I think. I think this is the first promise of the Redeemer coming. Christ. All right, so what happens in uh, verse 17? Genesis 3, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. The ground's cursed. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Ooh, you know, you, if you've ever been a farmer, what, what grows up? Weeds. Trying to grow food, is it's, it's hard work. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. When's the next time the word cursed, or cursed comes? Genesis chapter 4. Cain kills Abel. And God pronounces this upon Cain. Genesis 4.11 And now art thou cursed, cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Cain killed Abel. And God says you're cursed from the earth. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I could make a whole study out of this whole just cursed. Deuteronomy chapter 27, 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molted image. Think about that next time you see statues of Mary or Jesus or whatever they want to call it. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and put it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. 
That's why I don't believe in church art, people, right here. They call it art, but really, is it a graven image? I, I don't know. How about this? Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 21, 22, and 3. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say amen. We're not talking about a dog sleeping in the same bed with you. Okay? Just, you know, sleeping. We're, you know, when you lieth. They're talking about sex, people. You know, the, you know it says uh, in, De uh, was it Deuteronomy? Uh, a man that lieth with mankind as he lieth with womankind um, hath committed an abomination. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what they're talking about. You don't lie with a man. A man doesn't lie with a man like you lie with a woman. It's abomination. I wish the churches would preach that in San Francisco. But they don't. Verse 22. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister. You don't want to lay in the bed with your sister. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Okay? Yeah. Were the laws nailed to the cross? All the laws? I don't think so. I think the ceremonial sacrificial laws, the blood sacrifice laws, the, the killing of the bulls and blood of goats to be upon the altar, I think those laws were nailed to the cross. They were fulfilled in Christ. Christ paid the ultimate penalty. He was the sinless Lamb of God. His blood was shed. The, the price, the penalty, and the price for our sin was paid in full. I wish somebody would tell the churches that want, that, uh, the, that want to re help the Jews rebuild their little temple and start doing animal sacrifice again. That's going to be an abomination unto the Lord God. God the Father and His Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah. But these, but there's different types of laws. There was the laws of blood sacrifice that the Levites performed. And then there were the laws that the king was to enforce and perform. The laws of murder. If, if, if a man killed his neighbor because he wanted to steal his his cattle and his horses, well, the king was to enforce that. You know, there were different laws. Now, the, the Levitical blood sacrifice laws, absolutely, they were nailed to the cross. They were fulfilled. They were paid in full. But does that mean that brothers can sleep with their sisters? and call it a marriage? I don't know. The Old Testament seems to um, say otherwise. All right, let's 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 get back to um, Canaan and his family tree. All right, turn to Genesis chapter 28, verse 1. Now, God made a covenant which is like a contract with Noah. And he made another one with Abraham. Then he reconfirmed it with Abraham's son, Isaac. And then he reconfirmed it with Isaac's son, which was Jacob, who God renamed him Jacob to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons and daughters. And the twelve sons were the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? Genesis chapter 28, verse 1. And people will take the New Testament and say, Oh, this is totally done away with. Nailed to the cross. Doesn't matter anymore. Genesis 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him 
You know what a charge is? It's a command. And charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, N-O-T, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Don't do it. Don't take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And everybody will say, well, that's because they were unbelievers. Well, why didn't God say, oh, we'll send some evangelists to them. Let's convert them. Let's tell them about the Lord. It doesn't say that. You know, it says, don't take a wife of the daughters of the Canaan. Don't do it. Genesis 6, people, I got a playlist, the sons of God. It's probably a 15-hour study. When you get through listening to 15 hours of that study, you will understand exactly what happened in Genesis 6. Believe me. There's no other way around it. You know, just because you read John 3.16 doesn't disregard the rest of the Bible. You know? All right, let's keep reading somewhere else. Now, Esau was Jacob's brother. Okay? Abraham had Isaac and um, Ishmael, but Ishmael was not to be a promised seed. Isaac was. Then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob, and Jacob became Israel. So, what does Genesis 36 and chapter 2 say? Now, this is Jacob, Israel's brother. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ahabodamab, whatever, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. Sorry, I some of these words I can't. They're, they're tough, okay? But it, you know, people uh, get on you because you don't pronounce things right or or you don't know dates. Uh, you know, it's it's not the names and the dates that are important, like they teach in the stupid Common Core garbage in the public schools. It was the event. That's what matters. So what do you know the War of 1812 was fought in 1812? Why? Because England tried to get in the, their colony America back. And America said, gave them the middle finger. It says, no, we ain't coming back. And another thing, too, is um, a lot of people don't know it, but in World War I, the majority of the American people wanted to go to war in World War I, not against Germany, but against England. Germany never burned the capital of America in Washington, D.C. The English did. We wanted to help the Germans uh, uh, defeat the English. But somehow the American media and politicians had us destroy Germany. You know, Germany didn't do anything to us. Well, they sank the Lusitania. But the thing was, Lusitania, the reason it's never been uh, explored like the Titanic, the reason being is because it's full of bombs and explosives and torpedoes and bullets. The divers went down there and they looked at all the unexploded bombs and they says, um, exit, stage left. They got out of there. That you don't want to be exploding a bunch of unexplo you know exploring a bunch of unexploded bombs. It could go boom, you know. I'm telling you, the stuff like that. Just because it's under the water doesn't mean it's corroded and it won't go off. So, all right. Um, let's see what else. Now here's an interesting verse. Genesis chapter 10, verse 19. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon. Remember, Sidon was one of the uh, daughter, uh, sons of Canaan. As thou cometh to Gerah, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. So Sodom and Gomorrah evidently were in the area of the Canaanites, right? Um, Genesis chapter 24, verse 3. 
Uh, I believe this was Abraham's servant going to get a wife for Jacob Israel. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Genesis 24, 3. Now, Genesis 24, verse 37. And my master, see, this guy was uh, Abraham, um, was it Isaac? Abraham? Yeah, Abraham had sent a servant to get a son for his uh, son Isaac. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in, whom's, in whose land I dwell. Huh. And Judah, uh, Genesis 38, verse 2. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. Yeah, Judah intermarried with the Canaanites. He had children by two different, at least two different women that I know of. One of them was a purebred Israelite woman. Genesis 46, verse 10, And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jacob and Zohar and Sheol, the son of a Canaanitish woman. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Here we go. Numbers 21 and verse 3. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up, delivered up the Canaanites. We're not talking about a pizza delivery truck here, people. And delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them. And they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. Yeah. Why did the Lord command the Canaanites be wiped out in the Old Testament? Genesis 6, people. They were the children of the fallen angels. It has to be. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 17. But thou shalt utterly destroy them. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. What did they do? Oh, they, they drove some of them out, killed some of them. And what did they do? They intermarried with some of them. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's see. Here's an interesting study. First Chronicles chapter 2. You want to do an interesting study on your own? This is it, people. Uh, chapter chapter 2, verse 3. I'm this you I could do an entire study on this. Uh, but I don't really have the time right now. The sons of Judah, you know, Judah, Er, and Onan, and Shelah, which three were born unto him of the daughter of Shua, the Canaanites. The Canaanites. And Er, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him. Oh, yeah. The Lord got angry at Judah's firstborn son because he married a Canaanite. He was evil. He killed him. Guess what? The Lord did the same thing to the second one. Killed him. Yeah. The third one survived. And then Judah went into um, the wife that he had given unto the, his Canaanite son. She was a pure Israelite woman, and she had two sons, if memory serves me correctly, and one of them was of the line that Jesus was born. But people say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. 
We're all one in Christ now. God loves everybody. Really. How about this? Zechariah chapter 14, verse 21. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more. And in that day, the, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Ooh. And yes, I know, Mark chapter 3 and verse 18, they'll say, well, Simon was a Canaanite. Simon was a Canaanite. Well, you know, I live in Florida. Am I a Floridian? Most people say I'm a Floridian. But guess what? I wasn't born in Florida. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But then he moved to Galilee. And everybody called him a Galilean. Uh, Jesus of Galilee, remember? He didn't live in Bethlehem, but he was born there. So, let's take a look real quick. I've already done an hour study. I think before we start doing a little genealogy on um, Canaan's and children and where they went, I think I to, what I ought to do is make a part two. I've actually got to start getting ready for work. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to close this out right now. And uh, the curse of Canaan. And then we're going to find out where Canaan's children and grandchildren, where they went to and what nations they founded. Matter of fact, if, if you've heard of Nimrod, he was of that lineage. And um, Babel, you know, the Tower of Babel, that was them. Babel became Babylon. Think about that next time you hear about Mystery Babylon. And Sodom and Gomorrah, all these places, all the bad things, everything connected with Canaan, Ham and Canaan, ended up being bad. I mean, I just can't find much of anything that was good in the Bible concerning that. Uh, one of the children founded uh, went to Egypt and Ethiopia. You know, basically, uh, you know, I'm not saying... Egypt and well, I'm not saying Ethiopia is bad, uh, but I'm just saying, you know, he got uh, Noah placed to curse that they would be servants, you know. So, all right, I'm going to make this the end of part. Uh, this is going to be part one. And we're going to take a look at uh, the genealogy of Ham and Canaan and the Canaanites and the children of the grandchildren, the children and grandchildren of Ham, which includes Canaan. So, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And people, Jesus is that light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God. That's Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.